Hi there, I'm Janet Lynn. And I'm Will Zeilinger. We are coming to you from Long Beach, California. We are a married couple who write together and separately. We also write under E.J. Williams for our new series, International Mysteries. We've met so many authors over the years, and with the advent of Zoom, we thought we'd chat with authors that we know and love. Today, we have Bill Fitzhugh with us. Hello, Bill. Hi, how are you, William? We're fine. Now, despite being of average height and not particularly fast in the 100 meters, though quick enough to capture, to escape capture at one time, Bill Fitzhugh somehow has managed to become an award-winning author of 12 satiric crime novels. Described variously as a polymath, a sophist, and just plain annoying, <laughs> Fitzhugh enjoys long walks on the beach, transgenic baboons, and shiny objects. Asked to name his major influence, he cites DNA, alcohol, and that eighth grade English teacher who said he would never amount to anything. He was smart enough to marry well and is currently working on a play. Bill lives in Los Angeles with his wife and an entertaining menagerie. Hello again there. <laughs> Welcome, Bill. Now, where did you meet a transgenic baboon? <laughs> Oh, I, I never met one, but I wrote about a bunch of them in the organ grinders. Oh, um, there was uh, the, the biotech industry is has been for decades uh, hard at work trying to find a way to transplant animal organs into humans because there's a shortage of human organs and there's money to be made. Mm. It wasn't very long ago. In fact, there was a story of a guy who received the first transgenic pig kidney. Hmm. Uh, and he, I remember. Lasted, I remember that. I remember yeah. reading about that. Yeah, he he lasted uh, a couple of months, I think. He 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 eventually passed, um, but he had other a lot of other underlying health problems, which is why he was. They were allowed to do that uh, uh, transplant in the first place. Anyway, so so that's transgenic baboons was uh, <laughs> from, from the organ. <laughs> I can because, just imagine uh, you shaking hands with one. <laughs> well, well, the, the 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 biotech people are working with are working with pigs because their organs are surprisingly suited in, anatomically for humans. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to use baboons because, first of all, DNA is closer, and the problem with transplants is rejection. Mm -hmm. And the, the farther the DNA types are apart the more rejection problem you have. So I went with baboons because chimpanzees, which are even closer, uh, are endangered. Mm. And, uh, and I like baboons. So. I like baboons Yeah, chips are nasty. <laughs> now tell us about your journey in becoming a published author. Yeah, long story. Um, you know, I started in, uh, in radio when I was in high school through the Junior Achievement Program. And the station that was sponsoring the, the Junior Achievement Company was Lamar Life Insurance Company, who happened to own WJDX FM and, or J, JDX AM and WZZQ FM, which was the big uh, rock station in, uh, in Mississippi. But even it, it had, a, it was a 100,000 watt vertical and horizontal transmitter on a 200 foot tower. So we reached into seven states. Wow. Mm. And the people who had uh, programmed the station uh, and, and were on the air before I was there, I grew up listening to it. They were all really intelligent, uh, informed about music. Mm -hmm. So I, I heard all this stuff. Uh, anyway, so I, I ended up uh, working, uh, writing the radio show for the Junior Achievement Company and, and hosting it because I had slightly less of a redneck accent than everybody else in the, <laughs> in the group. And, and of course, you know, th this was the coolest thing you could be doing in high school. Mm -hmm. So, and where I was, you know, a, roughly a D student. Um, and so I stayed on after the program ended and just hung around and finally just said, I'll work for free, which is what they were waiting for you to say. <laughs> at the radio station so I worked there for a while and so you're writing commercials and then I wrote some programs um, eventually moved to Seattle and met a, a guy and we wrote a radio comedy show sort of like the National Lampoon Radio Hour mm -hmm. and we turned that into a television pilot that we produced up there came to Los Angeles to try to sell that and everybody thought it was fine but they said well you, you should write sitcom 
scripts. So we started writing sitcoms, scripts, and got some very fringe television jobs. And then when the, uh, uh, the hiring season ended one year, we did like everybody else did and started writing screenplays. Mm -hmm. uh, couldn't sell any of those. Uh, finally turned one of the screenplays into a novel, uh, a screenplay that every studio in town had passed on. Uh, turned it into a novel and Warner Brothers paid an enormous sum of money for the film rights and then paid somebody to turn it back into a screenplay. <laughs> and, and then they never made it. Oh. Um, but that was fine, you know, uh, because then the publishers, you know, couldn't wait to publish it. And um, I did another screenplay called Crossdressing that everybody in town turned down I turned it to a novel and Universal you know paid more than Warner Brothers paid for the film rights oh. so I decided okay fine I'll just write these because it's all just storytelling right mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't you be, you can make it a puppet show um, but it's it's just telling a story in a different medium mm -hmm. so I just uh, started writing the novels and you know, stopped writing the screenplays and then later of course went back to writing screenplays under certain circumstances uh, but anyway, so that was it. It was radio, uh, trying to get into television, trying to write films. So everything was, you know, every step along the way, the works got longer from 30 second commercials to sketches, to sitcoms, to screenplays, to novels. So uh, it was it was a, a good training ground. Yeah, it would be. Wow. I mean, that's, that's quite a journey. But so after writing a dozen novels... How'd you come about writing a stage play? <laughs> well, uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> it was, uh, it was, it, well, this goes back to the organ grinders, actually. Um, uh, the, the playwright, uh, Leonard Gersh, who wrote Butterflies Are Free mm -hmm. and, and a lot of other stuff, but that's what he's most well known for. Uh, somebody I happen to know, and he read the organ grinders and, and sent me a very funny email one day saying, oh, you should turn this into a musical with the baboons doing the song. <laughs> and, he, and he wrote some funny lyrics uh, that I, and it was very funny, but what was I going to do with that? I wasn't going to turn it into a musical. So I filed that note away. And then one day, years later, uh, 15, 20 years later, there was a, a news article about a guy in Georgia who was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease. Oh. And he, he wanted to um, instead of die of Lou Gehrig's disease, wanted to donate all of his organs now and die that way, save eight people's lives and not die of Lou Gehrig's disease. And at some point, and I knew that was a great story idea, but it was very dramatic and I don't do dramatic. So I, I wouldn't, didn't know what to do with it. I just wish I could come up with something. And then one day, you know, the light bulb mm -hmm. went off and it's like Leonard's idea about the musical. So I had this idea of the guy who's diagnosed with the disease uh, is wants to do the same thing, donate his organs instead of die of the disease. And word gets out. And the next thing you know, there's a knock at the door and it's a Broadway producer who wants to turn the story into a musical. But I was like, well, it's going to have songs in it. And how do you put songs in a novel? So I guess I just write a play. <laughs> And because and, and, and the, the thing was that, uh, first of all, I can't write music. And second of all, if, if you wrote original music and you put it in a novel, no one would know what the music was unless mm -hmm. you put musical notation. And then the reader has to be able to read music unless you take a take a bunch of well-known public domain songs and rewrite the lyrics then everybody knows what how the battle hymn of the Republic goes in terms of its melody mm -hmm. or Midnight Special or God Rest You Merry Gentlemen, all the songs that people know, you just rewrite the lyrics and they can read and sing along. So, <clears throat> so I wrote it as a, as a play, um, submitted it, and it's finally landed at, at a theater here in Los Angeles, the Group Rep Theater, mm -hmm. which is in development. And um, then I got a call from a publisher in London who said they wanted to uh, reissue all of my books, which was oh. great. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he said, well, uh, are, are you writing anything new, a new novel? I said, well, uh, of course I am. It's about a guy <laughs> who wants to write a play about a guy who wants to donate his organ. <laughs> so, uh, hang on. <laughs> so that's the perfect harvest. The perfect harvest. Yeah. So that's, that's, you know, I, I knocked that out. This is all during COVID, which was great. I, I wrote more stuff during lockdown. Did than, you? Oh, I wrote several short stories, a, a short play, a whole play, a novel. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> it, but it wasn't much different than, you know, my normal life. Because I, I normally just sit here in the room writing and go mm -hmm. to the grocery store periodically and not much else. I used <laughs> to be able to go swim. They closed my swimming pool. Yeah. Um, we swim so, too, and they closed everything. We just went through agony. Yeah, yeah, I know. This is the longest period of time I've gone without exercise, and I feel great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about your radio show on Sirius XM. Uh, boy, that was great fun. It was, uh, uh, I, I was on a book tour, and I had been contacted by the guy at um, uh, Sirius XM had a channel that did um, classic radio dramas. You know, and comedy, Fibber McGee and Molly and the Lone Ranger and the Shadow and all those shows. And he was a fan of my books. And so he sent me an email, asked if, you know, if I was ever in D.C., if I wanted to come in for an interview. And of course I did. So I was on tour for Fender Benders and um, met George Taylor Morris, who at the time was the program director for the Deep Tracks channel. And he and I, we just hit it off. Uh, we knew all the same weird music from my days in FM radio, and he's he was a big shot in, in East Coast FM radio. And I just one day said, yeah, I've got an idea for a radio show. And he said, send it to me. So I, I did a rough version of it in my little studio. And he said, this is great. You know, I said, are there any rules? He said, no, nah, do what you want. <laughs> So, and it took a while to sort of really dial in the actual format, but it ended up with a, a two minute introduction, a 26 minute set of music uninterrupted, followed by a two minute outro, which 30 minutes. Um, and the sets were, uh, there were two sort of different types of sets. One of them was just uh, a series of songs that sounded great together the the last chord of one song would be the same as the first chord of the next song and so they would seamlessly go together the other one was more um mashups and segues and mixes that were really interesting where um uh there's a, a long instrumental break in uh the middle or sort of a weird psychedelic break in the middle of led zeppelin's whole lot of love Mm -hmm. and, you can, and you can lay over the uh, uh, percussion portion of Chicago's I'm a Man into this. So they're both playing at the same time mm -hmm. and things match up. Uh, there are other songs that have uh, false endings. And then when they were where they would return, you can go to a different song that has the same like a drum lick. At the, Led Zeppelin did this a lot. They would have uh, the, they'd be playing along and boom. But, but and then they start again but instead of starting Led Zeppelin you start something else that starts with a drum and then, and then that goes and, and, and stops has a false ending and then you go back to the Led Zeppelin or you go to something else so it was just playing with the the songs and the rule was that you had to be able to do it with two turntables and vinyl that's hard two ta well, just two tables that's it yeah, that you know, I had two turntables, a mixing board, and a CD recorder, and uh, th talk those about, are the rules. Talk about stress. <laughs> oh, uh, they, 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 more than once, I, I, I would be, you know, twenty four minutes into the twenty six minutes, and I'd screw up, and I had to start <laughs> over. Again. Well, it sounds like you learned a lot about music along the way. Well, yeah, you know, I've been collecting records since I was in sixth grade or something, and I've got a, a, a pretty big collection. I, I keep selling. Uh, weeding stuff out of it but uh yeah you know i i yeah i can hold my own if if, if you need me to run your fm rock radio station <laughs> no that's great that's super so along with this variety of things <clears throat> you've written sketch comedies you've written sitcoms novels short stories short plays and full-length productions are any of those a favorite uh, you know, um, 
Screenplay is maybe my least favorite. They're very difficult to write well because they're not really designed to be read. They're simply a blueprint for a director to make a film, you know? And so they're hard to write. Like I said, I, I think it's one of the reasons that people, the, the studios didn't buy my pest control or cross-dressing screenplays. They were just, they, they weren't rendered that, the, the execution wasn't great. As a novel, I could essentially make you see the movie because mm -hmm. I can tell you exactly what you're looking at, which you can't do in a screenplay. You're not supposed to call shots. Um, and so people would read the books and say, oh, I, this, I, this is like watching a movie. It's like, well, that's the idea. Uh, mm -hmm. So screenplays are least favorite. I like, you know, it, anything that I've got, what I think is a good idea. I enjoy writing and I'm, I'm writing another short play right now for this festival that we did last year called Motel 66 at the group rep where uh, they, they'll get a bunch of play submissions for 10 minute plays. And it's all set at a motel somewhere on route 66. So the same set, everybody has to work with the same set and only four actors and 10 minutes. And I you know, had a great idea last year and then they produced that one. And I've got a, what I think is a great idea this year. And I'm mm. working on it right now, trying to put it in shape and it's great fun. It's, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you know, when you, you, you got an idea and you're trying to execute it and it's like, yeah, these are, these are all good parts, but, eh, eh, oh, wait a minute, put this one. Oh, you know, and, <laughs> it just, and it's fun, right. To, uh -huh. to, to, to realize that you've got the good idea and you just got to figure out how it really works. And then when you start putting it together, it's like, this is great fun. <laughs> yeah, that's how I feel about writing. You got this idea and where ideas happen, you connect it, it and it turns into something good. <laughs> yeah. Something well, entertaining. Yeah. So that's, it does. So it doesn't matter if it's a, 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 a sketch or a novel or, or mm -hmm. a short story. If, if I'm excited about the idea, um, it's, I, I like writing it. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, and I won't just sit down to try to write a novel because I should be writing a novel. It's like, if I don't have an idea that I'm excited about, it, life's too short to sit here and, I know. and do that. Definitely. I have to ask you, what did you read when you were a kid? Um, well, <laughs> uh, High Life magazine with Goofus and Gallant. Yeah, and I, was, I like and I that. Liked you know? Goofus. Yeah, I guess. Um, I remember that. <laughs> no, but I, 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 Kurt Vonnegut was one of the writers who I, I was reading in grade school, sixth, seventh grade. Uh, so I think I read most of Kurt Vonnegut stuff that had come out by the late seven, no, early seventies, mid seventies. Yeah, early seventies. Um, and things like uh, Richard Brodigan's uh, uh, Trout Fishing in America, um, uh, Hunter Thompson stuff. Mm -hmm. was was always intriguing and, and i remember reading papillon in sixth or seventh grade and was just thoroughly engrossed with it i didn't read any mysteries i never read uh, i may i maybe read a little hardy boys mm -hmm. but not I, I don't remember them like I, a lot of people in the mystery community are <clears throat> that they they all really read nancy drew and hardy boys and mm -hmm. uh, all those uh, the 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 canon and I was reading uh, Otter stuff, I think, generally, um, <clears throat> and uh, Confederacy of Dunces, uh, <laughs> probably my all-time favorite novel. Okay. Um, so stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What about TV and movies? What did you like as a kid? Uh, <clears throat> I, 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 I like television way too much. <laughs> uh, yeah. And... You know, and I love the Twilight Zone uh, and Outer Limits and no, um, beyond yeah. that. And uh, uh, a lot of the Quinn Martin productions, 12 O'Clock High and yeah. things like that. Uh, and, and so there was Rat Patrol. I loved all the sitcoms and I loved variety shows mainly for the comedians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Though, though I would. And, you know, so that's old school stuff. I mean, that's Henny Youngman. You know, uh, those guys were still doing uh, variety shows in the 60s when I was, you know, a kid watching television. Jackie, Jackie Mason, those guys. Yeah, that that whole uh, uh, the Borscht Belt, the, the Catskill. 
people. Um, and, and then weirdly, I, I became a fan of Firing Line. Mm. Uh, I can remember not understanding, I'm sure, 90% of what William Buckley was talking about. Um, but I just, uh, smart people having a, an intelligent uh, discussion or a debate about things. Uh, Dick Cavett was good. Um, so I, a variety of things. Mm -hmm. Now, Bill, what advice would you have for someone who's just starting out in either uh, writing uh, novels or short stories or sketches? What would you suggest to them? Uh, well, uh, do, do what I did. Marry well. <laughs> <laughs> Don't my, my wife has a, had a real job. Yeah, I had a real job. We got married. <laughs> Uh, you know, graphic, there's there's I'm just designer, so I needed somebody with a real job. <laughs> the the odds, you know, it's 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 a tough row to hoe. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, from from a writing standpoint, it's just write and write more, and and you know, mm -hmm. um, get feedback from people whose opinions you have judged to be worthwhile. Yeah. I, you know, I've been in in writers groups, and I did. Um, a UCLA extension class when I was writing a novel and there were, you know, 20 people, half of whom were uh, describing themselves as recovering attorneys. So, <laughs> these, these, you know, well-educated people um, and everybody would read someone's work and comment on it. And you could tell that there were four people in there whose opinions, they just, they didn't know what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. So there's just no point in, but there are some other people who had some really good insights and listen to and be willing, listen to new ideas, be willing to uh, change stuff because you know, don't just get married because you wrote it and you think it's great. It might not be. Mm -hmm. and it frequently isn't. Mm -hmm. And I throw stuff out all the time. I, in fact, the, back to the organ grinders one more time. When the publisher from London uh, wanted to reissue everything, I, I asked if I could re-edit that book because it had not really received a good editing at HarperCollins because the, the acquiring editor uh, was promoted. She gave the book to somebody else who then quit and joined, went to the advertising business, who handed it to a third editor who figured two other editors had already worked on it, so he didn't need to do anything. Uh -huh. So the book really didn't get edited. So I, uh, for this new publication, I cut 20,000 words out. Of it. Uh -huh. So, I mean, so I was in love with them, when, you know, the first time did, around. Did, did it hurt? No, yeah, no, no. It, it, what hurt was knowing that that bloated thing was out there. Yeah. Years later, when I realized how bloated it was, how much crap was in there. Uh -huh. And there, there was, it was muddy and it need, it needed clearing up. And so taking those 20,000 words out was very satisfying. It probably could have taken another five out. <laughs> so yeah, you know, uh, less can be more. I agree. Totally agree. Yeah, as a, a visual designer, you know, visual arts for my career. And uh, I had professors who said that said, you know, if you can keep taking things out of your design, then they weren't needed. You know, and it still works. Mm -hmm. Exactly it's like, right. Goes for writing, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a post on Facebook yesterday about so, uh, Simon Wood. I, I think was saying was kind of making a joke about the phrase "extramarital affair," and I my comment w was that I, saw, he, I saw that I saw, saw that, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my question, my comment was simply, "Well, it's just unnecessary words. If I tell you I'm having an affair with somebody, you know exactly what I'm doing." Mm -hmm. It's it's unnecessary words it, that bring no new information. So it's like it's okay. 10 a.m. in the morning. Well, it's 10 a.m. <laughs> is fine. I know it's morning if you say that. <laughs> That's true. So, so don't, don't put in extra words. <laughs> <laughs> so, Phil, I'm going to ask you what I ask all of my authors. Do you eat or drink when you write? Uh, coffee or water. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um no no uh no adult beverages um and no i don't eat no i don't, I don't think so i no kids you can't type if you got hand if you got a gun stick <laughs> in your hand how are you going to type um I, I i might read over something while i'm you know eating a sandwich mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Because that's why, you know, you, you write a page and then you just read it again and again and again and you cut stuff out and you throw new mm-hmm. things in there. Um, but by and large, I would say no. Yeah. And do you listen to music when you write? Can't do it. I get so distracted. I'll start listening to the music mm-hmm. and I'll just stop what I'm doing. <laughs> you see, I'm one of these people, I need to have noise in my head and food in my mouth. So I have to do all three of these things. But he writes in dead silence. And do you eat? No, I'll have some water with me. But I admire yeah. no, people who can do that. I will. Uh, there's plenty of noise around here anyway, just from uh, leaf blowers <laughs> and helicopters. And everything. Oh, yeah. I, I will put on noise canceling headphones to try to write hmm. just so I can concentrate. And hear, hear the voices in my head. Yeah. So, so what's next for Bill Fitzhugh? <clears throat> well, um, I'm, the, this the short play for this year's Motel sixty six festival, which um, is uh, uh, sacrilegious and lots of fun. Um, I'm, I'm working on that. Um, I've got and and this full length play. It, it just I, you can't believe how long it takes to get a play. <laughs> Produced. I mean, people complain about it. I can't find an editor. We'll try to get a play made. <laughs> um, uh, so I spend. I've 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 fallen in with these theater folk, and and they roped me. I'm producing a play now, um, mm-hmm. not financially, thank goodness, um, but it's just uh, coordinating between the set designer and the costume designer and the lighting designer and the sound designer, and you know, meeting and making sure everybody's got what they need. Yeah. So I'm producing a play, which is not really what I set out to do. <laughs> uh, but they, they uh, and, and then we've got a, uh, the play that's up now will end in a couple of weeks. So we'll strike the set and then immediately start to build the next set, which is I like building stuff and doing mm-hmm. construction things. So that's a lot of fun. I had no idea theater could be so much fun. That's great. That's good. Well, well this has been a lot of fun, though. So at the end of at the end of our interview, We'll have uh, your picture and your website uh, posted in case people want more information. Great. Well, thank you, Bill. Really appreciate you coming on. Janet, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay. Take, Take care. care. And we'll All see right. you in real life here soon, I hope. Hope to see you at the gumbo party. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Take All right, care. guys. See you. Thank you for watching. We will see you next time on Chatting with Authors. Be sure to push the subscribe button at the bottom of the screen. Stay safe, everybody.